Dr. Cornell, I wanted to ask you, you've been traveling the country and you're standing as an independent and this gives you, I think, the freedom to speak with moral authority and honesty. Um, what, is, what do you think is lacking in this country's political leadership that you felt you needed to make this stand and perhaps fill a void? Well, first I want to begin by saluting you and your magazine. It's a historic institution, not just a magazine, a historic institution because we are living in an unprecedented moment in the history of America. I think for the first time, it's very clear that the Muslim community at its best is more and more constituting the moral conscience of the nation. You see this in regard to Gaza. What is lacking in political leadership in America is any serious moral content let alone spiritual vision. And by spiritual vision, I mean just the notion of Imago Dei, that all human beings have equal status and significance. Uh, and by morality, I mean too much cowardliness. See, the big money and, and big power is dictating so many of the decisions of politicians, which is to say, they're thermometers. They have to check to see what the polls say as to what they say, rather than thermostats which is speak from their hearts and minds and souls. And what is wonderful about the, your magazine is that it becomes an institutional vehicle for this grand Muslim moral renaissance that says that Palestinian babies have exactly the same value as any babies in the world. And to be able to see that criteria so violated by most of our political leaders, be they Democrats or Republicans, it's sad. But the, the good side of it is, is that when all of us come together, because see, I come out of legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and he always wanted to be the more conscious of the nation, not by himself, but the movement. And now that you've got Muslims and black folk and prophetic Jews and prophetic Buddhists, and prophetic Hindus all coming together to say, we have an indictment of the White House, of Congress, of foreign policy. It's a very powerful moment. Um, and you say there is this historic relationship between um, uh, the um, black civil rights movement and the struggle for Palestinian freedom. A lot of them have been very supportive, Absolutely. as you have, of course. Uh, why is it that you think that our current political leaders can unite against Russia um, when it occupies Ukraine, but for some reason they can't do the same thing when it comes to the this long-standing occupation of Palestinian land and, and you know, speak against Israel. What is the stranglehold? I think one is that, uh, as we know, Ukrainian babies have the same value as Palestinian babies. All those babies have equal status. But to support the Ukrainians reinforces the status quo in America because they've already got an anti-Russian bias. To support the Palestinians means you cut radically against the status quo because the status quo has tried to make it normal that a pet Palestinian life has less value than a Jewish life or a white life. And we know that because if there was a Palestinian genocidal attack on Jews and Jewish babies, all of us should be in solidarity with our precious Jewish brothers and sisters. And we know Biden and the White House would. But when it's flipped over, it's against the status quo. And so you have to say, we believe that the equal status of a Palestinian Israeli life means then we have to give a strong indictment of a policy that can see 13,000 precious Palestinian children killed and not one major politician give a speech against it that would result in not just a ceasefire, but end of siege, end of occupation. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of Gaza, as a Muslim journalist, I've been struck by the mainstream media's incredible bias, pro-Israel bias. And so, so if the IDF tells them that you have to say uh, the, the, the source for the, the death toll is the uh, Hamas-controlled or Hamas-run health ministry, that's what the media is saying. What does that say about American newsrooms that they can be so biased and so you know ready to take the um, follow the command of one side in in this situation? You think of the great journalists in the history of this country, 
I'm thinking of I.F. Stone, having to be a Jewish brother. Truth teller to the core. Seymour Hirsch, truth teller to the core. Ida B. Wells Barnett, black sister. Truth teller to the core. T. Thomas Fortune. Those are the standards of truth telling in journalism. Jeremy Scahill and others. The practice of the dominant journalists in corporate media these days is a sad spectacle. It's a sad affair. And they know it. They know they can't tell the full truth. So they can spend hours and hours on the suffering of Ukrainians when they are attacked. But it's hard to find a serious substantive story on the suffering of Palestinians when they are attacked. And so again, very much like so many uh, uh, instances among the professional managerial class, they're very smart, but also quite cowardly. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I, I, I often saw you on Anderson Cooper on CNN and CNN. So, since the Gaza war, I don't feel like I've seen you as much on there. I mean, do you feel that uh, networks like CNN, which have been criticized very heavily for their uh, basically refusal to cover the, 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 what's happening to the Palestinians, um, and any coverage has been seen as very sort of one-sided, do you feel that there is this kind of reluctance to have you on because obviously you've been very outspoken? You know, I've been very blessed in that regard. It's true that uh, Brother Anderson hasn't had me on as much, but Sister Caitlin Collins has, Sister Dana Bash has. Uh, uh, even the news uh, nation, Brother Connell, mm -hmm. uh, has had me on machine, I think his last name is. So I've been very blessed to gain access to it. What I have to make sure is I don't want to dilute my truths by dampen my fire for justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I've met some very moral and decent American Jewish people, many of whom are involved in interfaith work. Yeah. And, you know, they're very good people. Um, and they're very disturbed by the, the, some of the horrific scenes that they're seeing in Gaza. But they're, kind, they're torn because they also feel a sense of loyalty towards the state of Israel. Um, so they're in this kind of moral quandary. How do we make people like that? How do we help them to push, the, uh, pr prioritize um, humanitarian cause above everything else? How do we well, get them I, to do I that? I think that because, I mean, Jews have been terrorized, traumatized for 2,000 years or more. And therefore, they have a deep distrust, sometimes even a healthy paranoia of others outside of the community who they cannot depend upon. We saw that in the, in the, in the, in the Holocaust. In the, in, in the 30s, they fell it again in 1973. What I tell them is, my precious Jewish brothers and sisters, I am committed to Jewish safety and security. And I tell them, I am committed to Palestinian dignity and equality. You can never have Jewish security and safety when it's predicated on the domination and occupation of anybody, in this case, Palestinians. So in their minds, they are tied to their safety and security. Absolutely, I understand that. And, and I'm with them in that regard. But in their mind, they then say, the only thing that can render me safe is defending the state of Israel. That entailment does not follow. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And in fact, with a, uh, a far right wing government in Israel, attacking so viciously Palestinian innocent people, that increases the thing we're all fighting against, which is hatred of anybody, in that case hatred of Jews. Anti-Semitism will increase when you have that kind of action with no accountability. So the challenge becomes, how do you have certain non-negotiables, which are Palestinian dignity and equality, Jewish safety and security, all four of those are non-negotiable. How then do you attempt to move forward? My final question to you, Dr. West, is what is your message to the millions of Americans who are advocating for Palestine? And that's not just uh, Muslims or Arabs or Palestinians. It's, it's, it's Jewish people, it's Christians, it's young people, it's old people. There seems to be, um, you know, amongst ordinary Americans, a huge sense of, um, you know, sense of atrocity and a sense of um, a deep um, devastation about what's going on. Uh, I think a lot of them are feeling frustrated and they're feeling despondent. What is your message to them to keep them, you know, just keep them buoyed up? Well, one, I would say we must fight.
to ensure that there's a space for morality and spirituality in an overwhelming moment of barbarity. And what that means then, we can't fall into hate and revenge. It's got to be a stress on love and justice. And how do you keep love and justice alive? By being loving and fighting for justice. Our concrete examples have to be those that show to not just the world, but especially the younger generation who can become cynical and fatalistic and full of despair, that a life dedicated to love and justice, even in a dim and grim moment, is worth it. To succumb to the forces of hatred and revenge is to reinforce the worst of who we are as a species. And we are a wretched species. Greed, hatred shot through all of us but we're also a wonderful species. We can choose love and justice.